I think this is the uh, the lecture to follow. I am trying. I'm going to do my best to help you to to follow completely, fully. Uh, if I go too fast, stop me. It is important that we work in these next two hours or so. Uh, really focus. Uh, if you want, we can give a break in between. It, it is essential that you understand what's happening. Um, in a sense, all the previous lectures uh, we have seen with respect to rules, uh, with respect to uh, units, with respect to fits, etc., the Monte Carlo general simulation techniques, we are going to use everything, all the knowledge we have accumulated so far. Um, so, uh, what do we want to do in general? As you know, let's see, providing data. And uh, we have seen the review of the, uh, the, of the standard model particles. Therefore, exciting times are ahead of us. We should be uh, able to analyze the data and, uh, if possible, uh, do some measurements. If it's a discovery, all the best. Um, on top of this, there are new accelerators which are being planned, designed, for example, hydro <coughs> electron collider. Uh, international linear collider. These also are interesting from a, a design point of view. What kind of uh, processes, what kind of theories we could understand. So this is also important. Uh, so what do we usually do to, to estimate this? Uh, we, we propose a measurement. We want to measure, say, the properties of a, of a new uh, particle or we want to measure maybe the properties very well of a known particle. But let's focus for a discovery measurement for the time being. We need to either know our collider or design a good collider to, to give us this information. <coughs> so I am going to repeat this many times, but I have written here at the beginning, the idea is we enter the model that we want to discover into the computer in one of the Monte Carlo generators and produce events. And using these Monte Carlo events, we run simulations, simulation of the accelerator, simul effects, simulation of the detector effects, and we obtain the results to investigate the possibility of discovering this particle or not. We, that is what we want to understand. So let's pick a topic uh, for the moment. Uh, to make life easy, uh, I have picked up something, um, maybe you would say trivial, but I think it would be a good example uh, to learn what's happening. Uh, we have seen in the DSM lecture that some of the beyond the standard model uh, theories are proposing new uh, gauge bosons, uh, vector boson, uh, otherwise, uh, let's say, for example, in a grand unified theory, uh, we have the prediction of a new particle, W prime, uh, that we want to understand if it's possible to, to discover or not. So this W prime is a new particle. It doesn't belong to standard model. However, for simplicity, we are going to take that the W prime has uh, a vertex with W and a photon, just like you see here. And the couplings are like the standard model. The only difference could be W prime's mass would be heavier, width would be different than W. All right? Every, I take W prime to be very, very similar to W, except I, I make the mass very large and uh, width unknown. Branching fractions unknown, obviously, to be calculated. Now, uh, the, the question is, if I build a photon-electron collider, would I be able to discover this particle or not? For example, uh, we could foresee such a process that you see down here. Um, an electron from the electron side and a photon from the photon side. And then um, there is W exchange in T-channel, as you can see. Uh, there is. Uh, in the exercise, in the homework, we have studied the possibility of, of this thing, homework number four. There was the photo, uh, photon WW vertex, right? Now, now the question becomes, um, if I have 
photon w w prime vertex what do i do uh, so in this case, as you can see, the charge flows this way and the lepton current flows this way, so we have a neutrino going up. In our experimental apparatus, we are going to detect neutrino as uh, missing transverse energy. Uh, with respect to the W, I wanted to study its uh, hadronic decays. Sorry, W prime, I mean. Therefore, my, my final signature would be two jets coming from the decay of uh, this guy plus plus missing transverse energy. All right, so far? Okay. Now, how what is this, by the way? Yes. Uh, I can make this bigger, just to see. Okay. Um, then the question becomes about the order of things, maybe. How to do it? Um, assume I have a number of uh, colleagues uh, I went to Jörg, I said, well, let's propose an experiment. Jörg is going to say, well, did you do any feasibility study? Is it worth proposing such an experiment? If they give us money, is it worth doing it? So we are going to do exactly that. We are going to make a feasibility study. Meaning, we are going to put our model into a Monte Carlo generator, our signal. Uh, then we will calculate how many signal events we are going to produce per year. Uh, we have already discussed the third sub-bullet. What is the signature of the signal? We discussed this, two jets plus missing uh, energy, missing ET. Then, a natural thing to discuss, the next natural thing, are the backgrounds from the standard model. Obviously, the, uh, the process that was your homework, uh, W plus neutrino production, is going to be a direct background, right? It is going to give you the exact same final state, two jets plus missing energy. Yes? No? Yes. Okay. Um, we are going to produce also Monte Carlo events uh, for uh, signal and background. We are going to simulate the detector and we are going to find the ways of distinguishing signal from the background. Uh, of course, there is this uh, question that is highlighted. How can I trigger on the signal? This is an important question, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, but we discuss this later. I might forget. Please, please remind me. Uh, then, how can I reconstruct the signal events is the next question. Uh, that means, uh, I have to analyze these signal events and make sure that I recover the invariant mass of my W prime that I put in, into the system. Uh, so, after all these studies, I ask the same question again. Is the signal now distinguishable from the background? If yes, then we write the proposal. Maybe we'll get some money. So, let's talk about our tools. Um, when you work on a um, uh, on a new machine, such as this electron photo collider that doesn't exist yet, you have to calculate the luminosity of the machine. That means when you collide the electron and uh, photon beams, what kind of interactions you would get. In other words, what is the number of interactions per centimeter square per second? This is the quantity known as the luminosity. Uh, to calculate that, when you give beam properties, there are these tools in the first bullet that you can use. Uh, we are not going to cover those, but have it in mind that there is this possibility. Ah, maybe I should discuss the left hand side first. For the signal, as you can see, photon colliding with an electron, giving me a W prime and a neutrino, W prime decaying into two jet channel, and neutrino detected as uh, missing transverse energy. Fine. The background, the same thing with all known standard model processes, giving me again two jet plus uh, missing transverse energy. This is my direct background. It's, mi it's mimicking my signal. But as you can see, the final state is exactly the same. Yeah? Okay. Now, event generators, we have seen PTR compact mount graph, we are going to use that. Parton showering hadronization, we said we are going to use PTR. Okay? And then for detector simulation, we discussed 
TGS and DelFest. Uh, the setup on your machines, on your computers, are for DelFest. Do you remember why DelFest was good? Better than TGS? Yes, no? Do you remember why? DelFest. No? Um, PGS, the pretty good simulator, uh, does not contain the forward <coughs> calorimeters. The forward calorimeters in modern experiments are essential to have. These are calorimeters at high eta, uh, let's say around 5 or so. Well, in PGS, you can do two things to, to cover that. You can extend the barrel to cover up to an eta of, say, plus minus 5. But that would give you over-optimistic results. End cap calorimeters are usually not as good as the barrel. What, or you can... What's the relation between eta and calorimeters? You mean the eta distribution? Eta measures how close I am to the beam height, as you remember. It was the uh, pseudo rapidity. And number of charge particle production as a function of pseudo rapidity was Ah, excellent. Was was constant. So this is my beam pipe. Hmm? When we discussed the atlas detector the other day, uh, atlas detector's inner detector component, the tracking, was up to plus and minus uh, two and a half. If you want to cover the forward particles, really forward going, you want to go as close as possible to the to the beam pipe. And that means, well, you reach the beam pipe at eta equals infinity. But then you only remember this. The sigma by the eta is roughly a constant. All right? Well, almost. Therefore, uh, if I want to measure forward going objects, I need to have a good coverage. I need to have good, a good uh, calorimeter, for example. Now, uh, in PGS, uh, I can either omit the uh, forward calorimetry, that will make my results unnecessarily pessimistic, or extend the barrel, that would make my results unnecessarily optimistic. There are other things which are improved in DELFES with respect to PGS, but this is the one that I can tell you immediately. Hence, we will use PGS. And naturally, rules for data analysis, since we have learned so much about it. Now, algorithm. Um, it looks a bit complicated, but don't get uh, uh, confused. Rather easy. So we start with a physics model. Physics model, which is predicting our W prime. We are going to enter this physics model into our favorite Monte Carlo event generator, which is compact in this case. Just follow the arrow. Hmm? Then we are going to take the events from Compact and send them out to PTIA. PTIA is going to do us hadronization, initial state radiation, final state radiation, etc. And then we are going to take the events and send them to PGS slash DELFEST. I keep here PGS just to remind you that there is also this possibility. It is going to do a detector simulation. Then uh, we are going to take those events and send them to this package called x root analysis and it is going to uh, make an entable out of the events. And we are going to write this part to do our analysis of, of the entables. And we are going to get some results that I have written in Turkish for some reason. <laughs> All right? Well, uh, I have also written here the name of the event file at every step. Uh, as you can see, it's always called events. But um, the type changes. I wanted to give you a hint of what the event format is traditionally at each step. If you remember from the other day, uh, Monte Carlo generators now are using this thing called uh, Lezouche Accord format, Lezouche event format, LHE. Um, PTL's output is usually in STD HTTP format, which is not a text file, this is text, by the way. ASCII file. This is not text, this is binary, STD HTTP. Uh, DELFES, both DELFES and PGS are given, giving out uh, events in LHCO format, which is a text again. And then XROOT analysis converts into root, which is a binary. 
and then you write your result in whatever format that, that you want. What else? Um, we are going to put our signal into compact because I find it rather easy to work with compact. I, I am sure you also do. Uh, but to complete the story, we are going to use my graph to calculate our background. So we will be using both simultaneously. And we are going to run and through this chain both signal and Monte Carlo events so that we have the same exact detector simulation, same exact um, treatment of the events. And finally, uh, people are going to write an analysis code to treat signal and background events separately. This is not the ideal thing to do, but for educational purposes, it should suffice. OK, now, let's focus on the first part. And let's try to write a BSM beyond the standard model model BSM. Model, model, anyway, in compact. So how do we start? It looks complicated, but it is not. Actually, um, you can get the, you, you do get the list of models at the beginning when you launch compact for the first time. And then uh, at the bottom, there is this option which says uh, create a new model. All right? When you select that, you tell the computer that you want to create a new model. Okay. Then it says, on which model should I base the new one? Um, you remember, we were using the standard model with unitary gauge, and we are going to take that. And let's, we will call our new model as the W prime, because this is the primary interesting object we are looking at. So far, clear for now. Yes? Stop me if, if, if I go too fast. OK. Then whenever we finish writing W prime and hit return, this uh, panel comes up. And you have the possibility of doing few things. But since we haven't changed this model really with respect to the standard model, we start by editing the model, which is also one of the items. So editing the model involves a number of steps. And let's see that. First of all, we need to add the new particle. It's our new boson W prime. We are going to go and add this guy uh, just in the same manner that W boson exists in the list of particles. You have seen, when we defined a model, we were talking about particles, constraints, Lagrangian, and uh, something else, and parameters. Now, we do, we do the same thing. Uh, as you see, for the W boson, we say, well, the particle is uh, W plus, the entire particle is W minus. Uh, well, this is two times the spin. This is a vector particle, so this two times spin is two. The mass of W is represented by MW. Width of W is represented by W lowercase, uh, W uppercase. This one stands for color. And this is the uh, format in latex, and this is the format of antiparticle in latex. So we do the same thing for the W prime. We write the name as W P boson, W prime boson, whatever it's up to you. The um, shorthand notation should be W P for the W prime plus, W M for the W prime minus. Uh, it's also a vector particle, so two times spin is two. Uh, the mass is. M, W, P, lowercase, and the width is W lowercase, W uppercase, P. The rest is the same as you can see. All right so far? Confused? Easy? Okay. Now, we, are going to, we have written this in the, as I said, in the parentheses, in the particles. Now, <clears throat> let's write W prime's properties. These are set in the variables section. OK? What, what properties? There are only two properties. Uh, the mass and the width. For the mass, I have invented a number. It's pure imaginary, a number that I have invented. 770. Why? Just like that, because I'm going to do a mass scan. I don't know the mass of the new particle. Later on, I'm going to scan this mass, but this is just to start. And also, I'm going to invent something for the width of the W prime. I put here 10 g. We will see. Uh, the constraints are not used. 
and the ah, and there is something else. There is this menu item called composite. Let's talk about that for a second because we are going to use. Um, by default, there, there, there are a number of jets defined, J1, J2, J3. Um, I'm not sure if the B jet is defined, JB, uh, consisting of a lowercase b and uppercase b. Similarly, it is nice to define a JW so that in your model you write uh, JW instead of specifying W minus and W plus separately. And I, I have now also written something called JWP, meaning uh, it should be a W prime plus or minus, I don't care. It's just a shorthand notation. All right? No? Confused? I am confused. Where are you confused? Uh, I moved okay. uh, J1, J2. Um, J1 is consisting of uh, some quarks, yeah. U, U bar, D, D bar, and then low. J2 is a more complicated object. It can also have S1. J3 is even more complicated. It can have a chart. That's easy. Okay. So you might have uh, cases like you say, I want to have a X plus two light jets. Then the origin will change. Uh, the, hmm? uh, the origin of the jet will change. Yes. Okay. Since uh, you are not asking, I am assuming you understand. So let's continue with the uh, DSM implementation. Now, the tricky part, modifying the Lagrangian. So we go into the menu with the Lagrangian, and we are going to find all the lines containing a W, all interactions. And what we do is uh, copy-paste. We can use an editor uh, to edit the file, but I really don't recommend it. Uh, Copy-paste all the files containing a W, and we are going to replace it with a W prime. OK, now W goes to W prime. For example, here is a vertex. This is the first particle, A, remember, photon, interacting with a W plus and a W minus. So this is photon W, W vertex. Uh, with some Lagrangian factors and with some uh, coefficients. Coefficient is about its electric charge. You don't need to worry about that. Then what you do? You take W uh, plus, you replace it W prime. You take W minus, you replace it uh, W minus, W prime minus. Now, what is this new vertex that you just defined? It is photon W prime, W prime vertex. Is that cool? So do you just copy it and then change it to W prime? Yes, exactly that, exactly that. Uh, because we wanted to do it this way, because we want to keep our model as simple as possible. Uh, if you are into the Z prime searches, for example, there is this thing called sequential Z prime, which is exactly the same thing. So I have invented a sequential W prime. All right. Now there is one thing that you need to be careful about. In this vertex, you are going to add yet another line. You know which one? You need to add the line with photon, standard model W, and the new W prime. So you need to add the vertex photon W, W prime as well, obviously, because we are going to use this vertex. All right? What? OK. What, what confusion? Tell me. Hello? 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 I'll help. Pass. Yeah, you can see that. I cannot <laughs> sit at the front. <laughs> yes. So will we keep the origin of W plus and W minus? Or yes, we will. Mm -hmm. We are going to add a new particle which is interactions to the standard model. So everything that is in the standard model stays. On top of it, we add more. A new particle and its interactions. OK. OK, good. Now, whenever you press Escape to leave this window, it says, uh, well, uh, it checks that you have written things correctly. And in this particular case, it will say, error in table particles. You have not been careful. And if you go back to the previous slide, you will see exactly the error. Here we have defined the width of the W prime uh, with a lowercase p. 
Uh, lowercase w, uppercase w, lowercase p. However, when we try to use in the slide afterwards, uh, when we were defining, uh, in, sorry, I should have stayed there. When, when we defined here the width, we have used an uppercase p by mistake. Look, we have defined it with a lowercase p, we are using now with an uppercase p. So this software controls little typos like this one. It makes sure that the model is uh, sub consistent. You don't name a variable x once and x prime in some other place. Hmm? So you go back and change uh, lowercase to uppercase or vice versa. And then so just yeah. a question. In the um, Lagrangian, we only add two extra terms, do we? Two. No, 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 no. There are lots of curves. So Remember, w interacts with quarks. W interacts with leptons. W interacts with other gauge bosons. So do we have to add two for each of these? Do you like that? Um, sorry. Uh, let's, let's, let's discuss that. OK. Just a sec. Let's discuss. Uh, This is your W. Uh, this is your, say, lepton. And this is your neutrino of the lepton, Valentine neutrino. All right? Uh, so in this case, you are going to duplicate this, convert W to W prime. This you do once. Uh, but there is also the possibility of having, well, for, for this one, you do only one modification. Now, you can also have this. W plus, W minus, uh, and, a, and a Z, all right? Here you have two possibilities. Either you change both Ws to W prime, or you keep one is in the standard model and you change the other one. So for this particular case, uh, interaction with a Z, then you add two, two new terms. The same thing with, uh, it could be, Photon or a Higgs as well. Whenever you have two, two Ws interacting, you have then two possibilities. Either you change both or you change one. In this particular model, I just invented. OK? Happy? Confused? Following? Yeah. Not following. I've lost. <laughs> Where were you lost? Where did we leave you? You can just do it with my uh, Lagrangian for W. So, uh, no, don't, don't do it at the same time. Just listen for the moment. Yeah. You can do it just uh, before the party. Is there any way to copy and paste the things here? You mean from the presentation? No, not the presentation. <laughs> Lagrangian part. Can we copy and paste? You can copy and paste the whole line. Just press F1 and read the help. Okay. Yes? Question? Okay, I continue. So, we make uh, uppercase to lowercase, and then the error uh, error is cured. Save corrections, yes, and then you have a new one. All right? Now, let's calculate the width of the W prime. Uh, somebody was asking me the other day whether it would be possible to say, uh, I want my particle, say, Higgs plus whatever else. One of you guys asked me this. And I said, you use as whatever particle you use an X. And this is what we do. This time, instead of uh, selecting a, in the menu, uh, selecting a scattering, we select the decay. Then the program asks you, enter the decay particle, as you can see up here. And then we say we are interested in the decays of the W prime. Remember W prime, we decided to write it as WP. So WP, and then final state, what final state should we have? Well, uh, it could decay to two particles, right? Uh, this is weak interaction. One particle decays to two particles. So we say uh, two times X. Let it decay to whatever. 
And then uh, you do the thing that you are used to, uh, numerical session, etc. And it gives you this, this, this window. It says, uh, now we are considering the process of W prime decaying to two particles. Uh, it has found 12 sub-processes. Uh, at this mass that we have given, 770, <coughs> it has calculated the total width to be something like 25 GeV. And these are the branching fractions. So what does it say? For example, to UD bar, it is going at, at, at the rate of 24%. To electron, 8.5. To muon, 8.5. And, and to tau, which is represented by letter L in this program, uh, another 8.5. All right, so far? Confused? Understood? So you said tau is the letter L? Yes. So I am serious. Huh? What is T? Oh, top, T, top. Top, yeah, of course. T for top, L for top. Right? right. It's, can be, uh, it's, it's uh, when we use in this program, it means whatever. Take any, any part of it. <coughs> Consider everything. Now, uh, remember, we said we were going to focus on the hadronic decays of the uh, new particle W prime, and we wanted to see two jets. W prime decaying to two jets. That's what we wanted to see. My W prime decaying to two jets. Now, uh, let's look at this one. If I have a U and D bar, I am going to have two jets, right? U and D bar gives me two jets. But let's, let's look at this one. If I consider top and a B bar, what do I have? Do you know? There are some things that we need to remember by heart, unfortunately. And uh, top part being special, peculiar is one of them. When you have a W prime decaying to a top and a B bar, you should remember immediately that top being a very heavy object, it decays immediately to a W plus another B bar. Hmm? Yes? Therefore, this W is going to decay as well, either lepton plus neutrino, leptonically, or to two jets. Therefore, when you consider the top decays of W prime, your final state now involves at least two B jets, plus at least sometimes a, a lepton, some, and sometimes two more jets. Do you see that? Not exactly, because, uh, well, what should I do? Yeah, what should I do? Yeah, what should I do? No? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, as I was saying, if this is your W prime, decay to a top plus P, your top part will decay to a W plus P, and that W will decay either leptonically or hadronically, then you end up having at least two B-jets plus, plus more material in your final state. Therefore, this is not a channel in which you would seek your signal. Because you said your signal would be the uh, two jet decays of this W prime. All right? You don't want to consider this channel because you decided at the beginning to focus on the two jets. There is one more jet in this one. Uh, well, there is one more lepton or two more jets. Yeah? yeah? Either leptonic or hadronic decay. Got it? So you want to decay only to two jets, kind of? I only want to con I want to consider only two jet decay. So all the momentum and energy goes to two jets. Precisely, that's the idea. All right? Yes. Okay. Huh? Now let's look at it. Uh, so this uh, top B decays. Branching fraction is something like 23%. So that means uh, this 23% is not going to be useful for me. Uh, just like this leptonic decays, which is three times eight and a half percent, is not going to be useful for me. So what is the uh, useful part? Uh, well, uh, eight and a half times three, uh, 25 and a half, unused, remaining 75% uh, or so, out of that, take out 23%, uh, and that means uh, you don't want. If you don't want top, that means 
you will be using out of the old decayed mold, decay mold, you will be using only 50%, actually 51% as the two jet decays. So effectively, when you make the decision of looking at two jet final states and two jet final states only, you already lost half of your signal event. Yes? Following? Still following? Okay, very good. Excellent. Now, since you managed to follow so far, let's move ahead. Let's now start considering the, ah, by the way, now it is time that you go back, edit the, uh, edit the model once more, and put in the width that you just learned from the, from the decay. We had invented something like 10, now we know what to re uh, how to replace it, and with what? 2,500 pounds. Good. Now let's look at the collisions. We said we are going to use a, a, an electron beam and a photon beam. Uh, now we say, we go back to the menu, we say uh, we are going to consider a, a, a scattering event, a scattering <coughs> something. Uh, and we say, well, the first beam will be an electron beam. Let's say the beam energy will be uh, 500 GeV. The second beam will be a photon beam. Uh, well, there are, uh, as I was saying the other day, there are two possibilities. Uh, uh, williams weizsäcker uh, photon beam, which are just the low energy uh, photons, and the other possibility is inverse Compton scattering uh, photons, which are the high energy photons. Obviously, I want the high energy photons uh, to have a, a heavy, to be able to create a heavy object of about 800 GeV mass. So I'm going to select that one. And in the compact notation, uh, they are marked as gum L, gamma uh, high energy L, uh, well, L, laser. Ah, thank you. Yeah, because uh, they are even obtained from a, a laser, starting from a laser. We also put in the beam energy of the second beam, the photon beam. We also write 500 here. We always write the energy of the electron beam, and for the photon spectra, the computer calculates it itself. Fine. PDFs, uh, 2, 3, whatever is written. And then outgoing particles, we write here. Um, neutrino, and uh, NFW prime uh, minus. So. Uh, what, what do you need for the distribution functions? Because you have the electron and the gamma. Um, uh, now, PDF number three, I believe, defines the ISR and uh, beam problem properties. That's what I remember, but we had to look into the menu. I don't remember by heart. Okay. Now, um, we do it uh, as we have uh, done so far. We have put exactly this uh, process on the top right hand side into compact. Uh, right? W prime and a neutrino, starting from an electron photon beam. We run the uh, Monte Carlo tool, as we have learned to do so, and we calculate the uh, 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 cross section, as you can see here. After 20 iterations, um, it is something like 1.6 uh, femtobar. Well, this reports the pico bar, but you convert to femtobar. Yes. It is the only uh, decay model? Currently, nothing has decayed so far. My W prime has stayed as W prime. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I mean, didn't get it. Uh, electron and gamma are scattered. Ah. I will get w Many prime. other things, but in the final state, I only consider a W prime and an neutrino for the time being. I am searching the cross section of this particular process which I am going to use to search for my W prime particle as my signal, right? So then, I said uh, something like 1.6 femtobar. Let's say this machine was the uh, ILC, International Linear Collider. You search in the documentation, you find its luminosity. Uh, it is this, 2.8 times to 10 to 34 centimeter per centimeter square per second. Uh, so you say, uh, well, um, this is not very useful to me. I want things in inverse pentobarns so that I can easily convert between um, 
cross sections and number of events available, number of events obtained per year. So what you say? Well, uh, also you get this was the actual luminosity of the E plus E minus collisions. For the electron photon collisions, it's an order of the order of, an of order of magnitude lower, so it's something like 2.8 to 33. And then you can convert it to, to inverse Tantobarn by knowing the uh, conversion between uh, centim minus centimeter squared to uh, one over centimeter squared, and uh, assuming that one good year with 30% efficiency is something like 10, 10 to 7 seconds. You use that, and then you find that the luminosity of this machine, which is being designed, is something like 28 uh, inverse uh, femtobarns. All right. Therefore, you can say, uh, I am expecting, how many W primes am I expecting per year? You do the math, very difficult. Uh, here is your cross-section, here is your luminosity. You get something like 46 W primes per year. All right? So far? Okay. Now, remember, in the previous slide, we saw that due to the branching fractions, uh, we were going to use only something like 50% of the of the decays. The others were going either to, to top quark or the electronic channels, which were not useful to me in the channel in which I was going to search my W prime. Yeah, you are following this as well, or are you are you lost? Not yet. Yes. No. Speak. Not yet. Not yet. Very good. So we also do this difficult calculation and find that we expect something like 23 good events per year. Ah, you can also use this 50% to calculate something called the effective cross-section. Effective because uh, this is not the real cross-section, but after, after the, your decision, effectively you are only using half of the, half of the available signals, so your effective cross-section is in fact not 1.6 that you got here, 1.64, but it's something like 0.8. Anyway, this is a rough estimation of how many uh, such events you expect. So 23 events per year, it's not so bad. Maybe you say, maybe you can pull something out of this. Now, let's see what happens with the decays. Since we want to insist on the hadronic decays with two jets, um, and now we want to consider uh, this process, and eventually up there, and eventually generate events, uh, we want to have two jets and a neutrino in the, in the final state. But when we specify, I want to have, say, uh, two jets. Now, you know how to specify and why you need the jet definition, plus an, a, an electron neutrino in the final state. It is going to give you a number of sub-processes, the, the two, like six sub-processes. And when you go and look into the available uh, final diagrams in each subprocess, you will find that apart from the one that you are interested in, mm -hmm. you are going to see other other subprocesses which contain the same final state particles, but not coming from the decay of the W prime. W prime is there, but it is it is in the T channel. Therefore, the invariant mass of, of these two guys are not going to give you the W prime invariant mass. All right? What's a T channel? Ah, what's a T channel? Okay. Uh, you remember the, your Mandelstam variables you have been uh, the first week? Um, basically, experimentally, they amount to uh, to have. Okay, you have two particles interacting and giving you two more part Let there be light. Okay. Your two fermions interacting through a boson and giving you two more fermions. All right? Um, there is this possibility, and all the energy is concentrated on this guy, hopefully, and this is uh, the propagator, and hence it will be sitting in the S channel. S, just like the Mendelstein gate. It will be carrying the energy that we have. Okay. So there is this other diagram, which is also a possibility, if the theory allows us. Oh, of course, the time is, is in this direction. Huh? Time. Now, there is also this channel, your fermion 1, your fermion 2. Then they exchange something which uh, seemingly occupies, well, uh, if this is the time, occupies 
uh, two places at the same time. Well, that's an old-fashioned description, but anyway, this is what we mean by T channel. And this is uh, this is the diagram that you have for W prime up there. So, uh, how did we specify? Uh, I want an electron beam now. Uh, I want a, a photon beam obtained from Compton backscattering through lasers, therefore gamma L. Thank you again. Uh, I want a neutrino. And I want two jets, J3, J3. I have chosen J3 because it is the richest jet sample, allowing both charm and stra strange quarks. And then uh, we said, well, nothing for the include diagrams. And we want to, uh, sorry, this was the first one was exclusion. Uh, and then for the inclusion, I said I want to see the diagrams with W prime plus and W prime minus. All right? And then it gave me this list. And from that list, now I have looked into each sub channel, sub process, and I have eliminated these guys, which are not going to contribute to my, to my signal. This guy is going to contribute. Why? Because when I reconstruct the invariant, well, when I reconstruct the invariant mass of these two partons, which will later on be turned into jets, I'm going to get invariant mass of this guy. The same for, for this one. Huh. This looks like, you will tell me, it looks like the T-channel because it's a vertical line, but it is not. Uh, this W prime really decays into a D and U bar core. It's simply the <coughs> fantastic program which is, which is not able to draw at an angle. It's that simple. All right? Yes? It can draw an angle sometimes. Yes, but in this particular case, it's uh, well, the algorithm is not, uh, is obviously not very clever. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to the numerical session, if you are still following. Uh, for the um, PDF, PDF in quotes, as somebody has asked, for electrons. Uh, SF stands for structure function, actually. This is also the, uh, another name or old-fashioned name for PDS. Uh, initial state radiation, beam stratum, some parameters of the, uh, of the uh, IRC machine. And the second one is laser photons. We have given the energy as 500. Uh, and then when you run over all uh, sub-processes, you end up with these averages, right? And then, uh, just like the batch mode that we have seen yesterday, you can do that uh, on the terminal, or you can just have that calculated and take a screenshot like I did, and then use your calculator to sum them up, and um, you get 0 0.82 again. Remember, when we calculated the total cross-section and multiplied with our uh, 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 branching fraction that we wanted to have, we had 0 0.8 above and now 0 0.8 again, right? Uh, this is the 0 0.8 that I'm referring to. We have calculated this guy, this guy, and then we said we are, our efficiency is 50% and it was 0 0.8, remember? Now we have done the same thing, but this time we have allowed the W primes to decay within compact, and again we ended up with 0 0.82. What is the advantage of this? Why did I do this? Why did I go over this hustle? Why? But now, now the, I can produce events. I can generate events. That's the advantage. Previously, I, I would be able to produce only W prime events uh, that I would have to decay somehow. Now I have let them decay into compact, and now I have two jet, uh, yes, two two parton plus a neutrino events. And I can generate events, send them to PTI as we discussed, etc., etc. Are you lost? In what we call events, do we have only the final state or we have the interaction? Excellent question. In the final, uh, in the event, depending on the event format, we have different things. But usually, we have the energies of the uh, momenta of the incoming particles. To keep things simple, uh, generators most of the time write out only the Z component, Z being the direction in which the collisions are happening, and then a uh, type of the particle. But it almost doesn't have any other momentum. That's true. Well, hold on. 
But ha but in the simulator, doesn't it uh, simulate like it's head-on? ISR changes things. Ah. Okay. The Instrum, it changes things. Yeah? Not always the same momentum. So we have information of the like longitudinal momentum? Yes. And all final huh. momenta. And uh, for the final state particles, uh, three momenta okay. plus particle type, or three momenta plus uh, mass, mass, or three momenta plus energy. Well, yes. since these are advanced. OK. Fine. What else? Should I go? Yes, sir. So what is the advantage of the lithium and in the concrete? I forgot. Uh -huh. <laughs> since you guys didn't ask this question, now you should answer to it. What is the advantage of having having W prime K in copper? It's easy. It's easier to do than doing it with you. Say, uh -huh. <laughs> easier than to do it in Pythia. Maybe. Uh, is you I went the difficult way and I have left my W prime on the K. You think Pythia would understand the W prime? That is the case indeed. Pythia, as it is, would only understand the part about the particles that it knows. And frankly, I don't know if W prime, if this particular interaction we have selected is implemented or not, I do not know. And it, frankly, I don't care because I can I can get everything boiled down to standard W prime. And also, this gymnastic of deleting the uh, uh, sub-processes, channels, uh, diagrams that I don't care about, I would have to do it in Pythia. Alright? Good. Sorry, can I ask another question? Please. Uh, so if we, if we assume, well, let, let's say uh, W prime is in PTS, is it still better to, to have it decay uh, in general in the matrix element level, or, or shall we take uh, PTS with it? It's not a far fetched question anyway. I think W prime with all the couplings exactly like a normal W is probably in PTS. Uh, but um, um, if I was, for instance, pair producing these things and such, should I let them uh, decay in PTA or is it better to handle this in a uh, What do you guys think? <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't know. This is valid, of course, but I don't think this is what I can get here. And you remember yesterday we discussed something about uh, jets, initial state radiation, double counting, etc. Yes. Were you trying to get there? Well, not exactly. For instance, but, but what I was trying to get at is what if I don't want to reconstruct only the mass of the object, but let's say I, I produce a new Z prime and it has a different speed. Mm. If, yeah, if I produce, maybe a pair produce these guys, it might turn out that at the matrix element level, I will do the computation properly and the two Z primes will have their spins correlated. Mm. Uh, and uh, when I do the decay inside uh, this matrix element level, the decay product of the Z primes will also keep the spin information. If I just uh, give this give, give this to PTA, PTA is going to well, let's say they take the two Z primes and decay them as if they are just come from uncorrelated particles. Uncorrelated particles. So mm -hmm. if you put a new particle and spin and is important for you, then you should uh, try to, to decay them in the in the matrix uh, stage. We get that, right? Okay. Now, let's continue. Um, w prime event production. Now, a bit uh, technical part now. Um, so maybe we don't need to produce the signal events uh, for all from all subprocesses. You, you will see that some processes are contributing more and some less. Uh, for a quick uh, study, I will produce events only from the uh, sub-processes which are really contributing. Yeah, given the um, 1.6 uh, 
uh, femtobarn of cross section, maybe 10 to minus uh, 4 uh, is a good threshold that says if your subprocess is not contributing uh, more than one per mil, then forget this process. Don't bother to generate events. So let's say uh, we have applied this, generated events as we have learned, and then that means uh, we have uh, all these event files. And as we learned, we can mix them uh, and end up uh, a single file containing events from all subprocesses that are contributing at least one per minute. Correct? Um, as you saw, uh, if you generate your events with the, in uh, uh, LHA format, when you mix them, the mixed file is called mix.lhe. Just like this. Right. Now, uh, we need to inject uh, these events into the chain of running PTR, PGS, or DELFS and XROOT analysis. The proper way of doing this is to get uh, from uh, a Compact web page uh, a tool called Compact Interfaces. It is this version. Uh, this is not available on the desktop uh, virtual disk, uh, but then it's not very difficult to download. You should anyway register to uh, Compact. I bet you are going to use it in one point of your life, unless you leave it. If given that, you will be using it for months. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is how you compile. This is how you configure compile, etc. This is how you set up. Uh, I have written that these things here uh, to be a reference for you. Later on, you might want to uh, you might want to read and uh, try it out yourself. Uh, so there is a work directory, I defined it to be this way, and then you copy the file uh, over there. Uh, there, is a, there is a Fortran called uh, Python PTA, uh, PTA, sorry, main, and then uh, the idea is that uh, you implement writing out of the events in STD HTTP format, uh, and then this is how you compile the thing, and this is how you execute the thing. All the details uh, are here. This is the proper way. I'm going to do it in a very uh, quick and dirty way later on. Shame on me, because I'm the path. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, let's talk about the background. So, we follow the same order. Event generation, anonymization, detector simulation, and topo making analysis. Fine. Now, we take Madra <coughs> and we produce the events. Uh, this was your uh, uh, fourth homework, actually, from last time. Since you did work uh, your homework, uh, I have marked that this is done. Yes? Uh, but again, all the steps are written here. Now, you know how to edit the um, data cards for process and run, how to change things, uh, and then uh, if, if you don't want to run generate, uh, uh, and take a uh, single step to do everything. These are the individual steps. You can say, well, uh, you have learned these commands, uh, run PTR, run that fast, and then you say extrude analysis. Uh, this is available in your, uh, all these things are available, by the way, on the, on the ESTAP uh, virtual book. And then you convert the events produced by that fast <coughs> into a root file. That's what it does, uh, Anthropo <coughs> make. At the end, I have decided to, oh, by the way, uh, by default, as you saw this morning in the exercise, DATFS is also outputting a root file on its own. <coughs> um, the names of the trees are slightly different, and it carries more information. It carries, apart from um, physics objects, it carries information about trigger and uh, Monte Carlo truth. If you want to check your uh, reconstruction, you obviously need the Monte Carlo truth. But then um, I want to run, I did run this manually, and I produced this sm.root file that we are going to use in our analysis. Yes, there was a question, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. So this was a bit fast, but I hope uh, you understand why it was fast. Now, I am lost. I am following. I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, 
This is the file that we need to analyze. Ah, I want to give a break. <laughs> wow, so many. Uh, well, you remember the breaks when you see them. So let's do it this way. Let's give a break uh, after after this slide, all right? Because the analysis part will be, uh, how should I say, painful. <coughs> and this was the easy part, by the way. Uh, now, uh, a morning, this is really the quick and dirty way. You should do it in the proper way. Don't, don't do as I do. Do it properly. All right? <laughs> now, what is the quick and dirty way? You notice that both MatGraph and, and Compep are outputting in uh, LHE format, Lezush event format. However, when you try to feed the Compep uh, mixed events into PTR, uh, Delfest chain, through the MatGraph setup, you will notice immediately that due to some event format uh, thing or header format thing, uh, the, the program will complain and it will not work. So my <coughs> terrible solution to this is uh, to do some gymnastics such as uh, to copy the uh, previous file that I have generated through the uh, real MatGraph chain uh, into a fake name called C for signal, and then edit the file, remove all the events, and leave the header only, and then take the uh, take the signal events produced by Compep and edit to the bottom of the header uh, produced by Magra. So I'm in a sense uh, faking the tool. Nevertheless, it works uh, if you do that. If you follow these steps. I have written every step carefully, copy-pasted. If you follow these steps, and, and I have given you examples on where to cut. For example, when I said uh, after the header cut everything, basically you cut after here. And then when you put in uh, the events produced by, by Compact, obviously you need to comment out few lines which are related to Compact, and then the rest will work like a chart. Therefore, you are going to be able to run PTR, DATFAST, XROOT analysis, and you will end up with a a signal that root file containing your compact events passed through the hadronization, detector simulation, and pentacle making steps. In a root tree based on an HCO format that was discussed. Oof, this is complicated. Yes, life is complicated, I'm afraid. Uh, as my friend uh, Jeff would have, said, would have said, all the easy things are done already. Unfortunately, you are back with difficulties. Okay. So now we have two files, a signal root file and a background root file. And we are going to look at to analyzing them next. Break for, break for. Break for everyone. No, five minutes. Ten, okay.